Hello, welcome back to our lecture series for Western Civilization 101. We've uh, left Greece behind. Uh, we finished discussing uh, Greek history and the Hellenistic period. And now we're going to turn our attention on the Romans and the Roman, ancient Roman world. Okay, and we'll find out with this first lecture uh, a little bit about the uh, predecessors to the Romans because, you know, obviously everybody pretty much knows about the Romans um, and how powerful they eventually became, uh, but they weren't always that way. Um, they weren't always that powerful. It, it took a series of uh, uh, very gradual events taking place to create what we know of as the Roman Empire, um, which is the most famous part when you see the different Hollywood movies and such. Um, you know, the Roman Empire will eventually include places like Britain, um, Spain, Gaul, Gaul, G-A-U-L, is, um, if you want to look at it on a modern map, you would look for France. That is Gaul. Gaul is France. Um, Germany to the Danube River, um, present-day Switzerland, Greece, Macedonia, Thrace, Asia Minor, Persia, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and the north coast of Africa. I'm talking an empire obviously, if you've gathered that, eventually. Um, but at first, they're nothing. They're, they're nothing at first, um, not that we know. Now, you know, for the geography of Italy, uh, it had a few good harbors along the coast. Um, they had a, a mountain chain that will pretty much split the Italian peninsula down the middle. Um, so we're not seeing uh, the Greek mountains uh, like we did for the Greek lecture and, and the different, lots of different mountains and so the city-states are developing in a totally different culture and politics and, and society there. Um, we're not going to see th this mountain range dividing up the Italian peninsula like the mountains did in Greece. Um, now there were a group of people um, that lived in the northern part of the Italian peninsula and uh, they're called, of course, the Etruscans. And that will be one of your topics today um, that will be discussed. The Romans will get a lot, of, um, a lot of their practices from the Etruscans, which is pretty interesting. We also actually also have the Greeks. Um, the Greeks began to arrive in Italy, I don't know, around 800 B.C. maybe, a long, long time ago, and they will settle in the southern part, in uh, places like Sicily. You may have heard of Naples or Neapolis, same thing. Um, so the Greeks will also be a part of this region. The Etruscans living in the northern area, also a part of this region as well. Now, um, just a few interesting facts about the Etruscans. You know, you'll learn more in this upcoming lecture here. Uh, but, you know, we're talking around 800 B.C. They were located in a place called uh, Etruria, E-T-R-U-R-I-A, Etruria. Uh, and eventually they will expand, um, you know, they're situated in the northern part of the peninsula, but they will eventually expand south toward the Greek colonies. Now, the Etruscans, there are different uh, theories as to where they came from. Um, you know, some people believe, uh, some scholars like Herodotus, you've heard about Herodotus, the father of history. He wrote the, the history of the um, Persian Wars and he liked to make it very exciting and he kind of put his own twist and embellishment to his history, which doesn't make it very objective. But um, Herodotus believed that the Etruscans were a seafaring people from Asia Minor. Um, Asia Minor, of course, also known as Anatolia, also known as modern day Turkey. And uh, others believe that they had Italian origins, that they were uh, native to the Italian peninsula. But either way, 
They eventually dominate Italy um, and will, of course, spread their ideas and culture to the Romans as well. They were a military people, the Etruscans. They had walls. They built cities. Um, they uh, were had an alphabet based on Greek. They were skilled artisans who traded with the East. Now, when we have talked about the ancient Near East and we have discussed ancient Greek history, when we're discussing Rome, this time period is kind of like starting over again, okay? Because um, I'm talking around 800 B.C. So I'm not saying that each of these periods between the Near East and the Greeks and the Romans took place consecutively. No, I'm talking around the same time period. You know, as the um, Greeks are going through certain instances, the Romans will be doing something else, okay? I just want to make sure that's clear. Just because we take these um, periods separately does not mean they're consecutive. Now, Etruscans... Uh, showed, it seemed like from uh, what we can gather, that they showed their women uh, uh, more of respect for women, and we don't usually, we didn't have, we didn't see that in Greek society. Um, Sparta society, remember, we let, the, they let the women, of course, have a lot of power because the men were all fighting a lot. Um, and of course, we know with the Athens, the respectable women were kept private indoors. Um, they, they didn't mingle and go out in public and go to meetings. The, um, the women that had the poor reputations, the prostitutes or the courtesans, actually had more influence in Athens than the respectable uh, women did. But it seems that with the Etruscans, there is a, a greater respect for women. It seems like they would, the, the males and the females would eat together, um, which usually didn't happen as well. Okay, and that they, they could, the Etruscan women could participate in, in gatherings and, and public life, uh, more so than we've ever seen in um, Athens, of course. Now, the Etruscans will also pass down a, a lot of what we think of as Roman, for example, the toga and the short cloak get from the Etruscans. Um, the use of the, the symbol, the axe, surrounded by a bundle of rods, it means it's a symbol for power, the power to scourge and execute and hence to rule that we've seen the Romans take that symbol, also comes from the Etruscans as well. The uh, first roadbed, known as the Sacred Ways, built around 575 B.C., also from the Etruscans. The Etruscans influenced the Roman military, um, adopting the infantry system of the Greeks with the shield and body armor, um, and not just relying on the cavalry. Um, so there's other things, of course, but the Etruscans were very, very important to the development of what we know of as you know, Roman history today. Um, of course, there was a legend about the founding of the city of Rome um, that took place. There was legendary founders called Romulus and Remus. There was a fight between the two brothers. Romulus wins. That's why Rome is called Rome, because of Romulus, of course. Um, this was around 753 B.C., the founding. This legend comes with this founding of the city of Rome with Romulus and Remus. All right, and eventually, of course, we'll talk about the, the government that we'll see developing as well. So let's learn more about the, um, the Celts and the Etruscans. Hi, today we're going to be talking about people known as the Celts and the Etruscans. And uh, we want to point out that long before the glory of Greece began to fade away, we have another civilization that's growing along the banks of what we call the Tiber River in Italy. And of course, that civilization that I'm mentioning right now is the Roman civilization. 
So we're starting the unit for the Romans, and we have to talk about some of these people that uh, they came in contact with because uh, this is uh, very important, because some of them are going to be having a lot of influence on the Romans. So long before the Greece of glory faded away, we have another civilization called Rome growing along the banks of the Tiber River in Italy. And uh, eventually Rome is going to become the dominant force on the Italian peninsula. But it wasn't that way at first. So eventually she'll become dominant. Eventually her power, her meaning Rome, eventually her power will increase. And she, Rome, I like to call her a she, <laughs> like most historians would, is going to become so powerful that they will eventually take completely over what was the Hellenistic world, or much of it anyway, much of the Hellenistic world, we have to rephrase that, but they will create an empire that will stretch all the way around the Mediterranean. So let's start talking about some of these people that influenced the Romans. First, we wanna mention the Greeks, and you might say to yourselves, what, the Greeks? Yes, uh, it, it, you remember in your last unit, the Greeks had uh, colonized at various places in the Mediterranean. For example, they colonized in Italy. So we definitely have to tell you that some of the earliest people to settle on the Italian peninsula were the Greeks. And they, of course, uh, had been arriving in Italy by at least, at least the 8th century BC. I like to be, say BC, even though the new textbooks say BCE. But anyway, so here we go, we have Italy, uh, excuse me, we have uh, Greeks coming, and they're, they're starting cities. For example, in your last unit, you may have learned that one of the oldest cities in the Italian peninsula is uh, the city of Naples, and that was started by the Greeks, uh, known as, uh, it was known as Neapolis, or New City. Anyway, so these Greeks had a lot of influence on Rome. Uh, they, um, learned, or excuse me, they passed on their alphabetic writing to these people known as the Etruscans that I'll talk about in a moment. And the Etruscans will be passing on this, this uh, Greek alphabetic writing to the Romans, and it gets modified for the use of the Romans. But anyway, these, uh, these uh, Greeks definitely had other influences on the Roman civilization. For example, they, they influenced uh, the Greeks. We're about to talk about the Etruscans in just a moment. The Greeks influenced not only the language, they influenced the, the art, the architecture, and they also also influenced the religion. So we definitely want to point that out, the religion and the mythology. Now we want to start talking about the Etruscans. A lot of people don't realize uh, that the Etruscans are going to create for themselves a, a quite, uh, shall we say, um, we'll use the term, I know it sounds redundant almost, but not really, a very civilized uh, society. So the Etruscans are important because a lot of the early development of Rome itself depended on these people, the Etruscans. Uh, th this early development of Rome was influenced greatly by the Etruscans. Now, we don't want to diminish the uh, influence of the Greeks, uh, but we're here talking mainly about the Etruscans and then we'll talk about the Celts. Anyway, the, the Etruscans uh, had settled in Italy by uh, at least about 800 BC or so, in and around maybe, maybe around the same time as the Greeks, but it was the Etruscans who are going to create the first, quote, great civilization on the Italian peninsula. And you might, again, be surprised at that. First great civilization to emerge on the Italian peninsula. These Etruscans had a written language. Their, their language was based on the Greek alphabet, as I uh, mentioned just a few moments ago. Uh, but their language is something that uh, confused uh, historians uh, for many years. Because for many years, people wondered, where did the Etruscans come from? Because their language wasn't related to the people around them in Italy. And there were different, shall we say, opinions, 
as to where they came from. But just recently, in the past a few years or so, it has been finally determined by DNA testing that we know where the Etruscans came from. They definitely came from uh, a place that we call uh, Asia Minor, which of course is now modern day Turkey. So we were able to determine this from, from the DNA testing that it confirmed they were from Asia Minor uh, in an area known as Lydia. And it's interesting because this, what I'm telling you now, is something that the Greek historian Herodotus had claimed anyway. But historians were reluctant to, shall we say, I don't want to say believe Herodotus, but we needed more confirmation to, quote, prove that what Herodotus said was true, that these Etruscans came from, from uh, Lydia, which is in modern-day Turkey. So that's pretty exciting for us to find this out. Uh, now, as far as the writings, again, I tell you that the writings of the Etruscans were, uh, uh, the uh, alphabet they used was based on the Greek alphabet, but their writing has not yet completely been deciphered. They've, they've been able to do some deciphering, but, but uh, not, uh, not all of it. Something more about the Etruscans, and it's very, very interesting. Um, how we get a lot of our information about them, believe it or not, it's through their artwork. Their artwork was beautiful, it was phenomenal, and hopefully you can see some of that on, on some of the slides. Oh, it's absolutely amazing, and I'll tell you a story in a moment about the artwork. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Etruscans started out in an area of Italy known as Etruria, Etruria. Of course, you could see the name Etruria uh, sounds uh, very similar to Etruscan. Yes, yes, it's, it's derived from that. So by the middle of the 6th century BC, now they had been there for a little while already, but by the middle of the 6th century BC, the Etruscans had established a bunch of cities in Italy. They had actually established what can be described as a confederation of cities in Italy. And uh, let me tell you, their, their uh, confederation of cities stretched over most of northern and central Italy, and they, the Etruscans, became, for a while, the dominant force on the Italian peninsula. Please remember, we are talking about the time before Rome gets her great power. Before Rome becomes powerful, these Etruscans were the most powerful people on the Italian peninsula, at least parts of Italy that I mentioned, northern and uh, central Italy. So anyway, I want to give you some examples of some of the cities that these Etruscans had established, cities like Bologna, cities like Milan, Cities like Pompeii are some of the examples of Etruscan cities. Now, remember, they had a confederation of cities. Uh, these cities would be run by kings, for example. And these cities were the centers of Etruscan life. Uh, they were cultural centers, uh, uh, and, 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 and they were just Oh, just their, their, their artwork, which we'll talk about in a moment. Absolutely phenomenal. Anyway, you might be surprised to hear this too. Their political ideology is actually going to be somewhat passed on to the Romans. And uh, we're going to talk uh, more about that a little bit later. We'll say just a few uh, more things about Etruscan society as far as what some of the historians uh, believe. They believe that, that Etruscan society was sharply divided between, we'll say, rich and poor, between, quote, lords and servants. Uh, they believe that most people worked the land and that uh, the, the uh, wealthy people benefited. More about the Etruscans. They were very artistic, as I've already mentioned, 
not just in paintings and artwork, which we'll talk more about, but also they were skilled in metalwork. They were skilled in uh, many other things. Some of the burial tombs of these Etruscans are so beautifully decorated. And some of these tombs were furnished with all kinds of things that the deceased could use in the next life. And we are talking about things like benches and beds and ornaments and utensils and containers, just to name a few. So this kind of reminds us of uh, some other cultures around the world, like the Egyptians, for example. This culture, the Etruscans, had also developed a, a uh, flourishing trade, we could say. They were trading with uh, areas to the eastern part of the Mediterranean. Another thing about the Etruscans is that they had a religion that was based on the worship of uh, many gods, you know, a polytheistic religion, and their gods uh, were believed to look like people, so their gods were in human form. And they also, the Etruscans also, connected these gods with, uh, um, shall we say, things like the sun and the moon, and of course, um, among the uh, planets, we would say they were connecting their, their gods with planets like Venus and Mars. Many of their gods would be used by the Romans, who would give them different names. Now, you might hear, hear varying uh, stories about this. Some people simplify it, and they say that the, uh, the Romans got their gods from the Greeks who changed, uh, the, uh, the, and the Romans changed the names. But uh, these people were all so closely connected. They, they interacted with one another. They learned from one another as far as the, the religion goes. Many of their gods, uh, again, um, were uh, used by the uh, Romans with different names, and they're also connected to the Greek gods as well. Another thing, about the Roman, uh, that, that the Romans are going to get from these Etruscan people and I'm sure other people that, that practice this, what they call divination. The Etruscans had sophisticated ways to tell the future and we hear this kind of thing about uh, other cultures as well. For example, they might examine the internal organs of a sacrificed animal to try to foretell the future. They might study the flights of birds. They might observe the patterns of lightning flashes. And the Romans are going to be using divination too. For example, when the Romans are gonna to wanna to go to war, they're going to want to make sure that the quote, omens are favorable. So they had certain people that would, that would determine that. One of the most amazing things about the Etruscans is the way that we believe they treated their women. <laughs> and this is going to be interesting because, believe it or not, women were believed to be well respected in Etruscan society. And they, they the Etruscan women, played active roles in Etruscan society. And the Romans and the Greeks are going to be like frowning upon it. Uh, listen to some of this. They took part in banquets. What? They presided over dances and concerts and sporting events. Are you kidding? They let women do these sorts of things? Oh, and this is another shocker. The Etruscans allowed their women to play uh, some roles in politics. Now, I'll explain. I'll give you an example. When an Etruscan king died, supposedly, the queen, his wife, would choose the next king. Now, given women that much power, are you kidding? <laughs> and let me tell you, too, <clears throat> again, the Greeks who lived there in Italy and the Romans, 
are really going to think that some of what the uh, Truscan women do is downright vulgar. Because as far as the Greeks were concerned, when, that, when there would be sporting events and, and banquets, uh, the wives did not attend that. They stayed home. Women did not get involved in politics in any way. So this is something that the uh, Romans are not going to, shall we say, take on as far as the way that the women are viewed and treated. So, we definitely want to now, uh, uh, before I leave uh, talking about the Etruscans, and I'll be bringing them up again near the end of uh, the lecture today, before we leave the Etruscans, let's, uh, let's say very quickly a few uh, fascinating things. Now this part is, is just information for you that, uh, that I got firsthand when I visited Italy, and it's just something very interesting to point out. I visited a part of Italy about four years ago called Tarquinia. Tarquinia is an uh, old Etruscan city in Italy. And at that city, there was a museum that had all kinds of Etruscan artifacts. They had, quote, what they called the city of the dead, where, where you could actually go and you could view some of these Etruscan uh, burial sites or tombs and you literally could go down into the ground and view behind plexiglass, you could view the artwork. They also reconstructed a city, uh, a city uh, beneath a recreation of many of these tombs that look even better than the, than the actual tombs themselves, who of course uh, these tombs have uh, aged over the years. The uh, Etruscans had, and we're talking about the high society Etruscan, Etruscans and their burial things, uh, their, the sarcophagi were, were, would, would be uh, decorated and, and be beautifully decorated. And many times they would show uh, a man and a woman reclining on, on uh, the, the lid, if you will, of a sarcophagus. So Tarquinia, Italy is is a beautiful place to visit. And it's in an area known, what's now known as Tuscany. Uh, Tuscany is part of the old Etruscan area in Italy, Etruria. So now what we're going to do is talk about another type of civilization that had some influence and some contact with the people that uh, you're going to be hearing a lot more about called the Romans. Now the Celts, um, are people uh, that inhabited Central and Western Europe. And, and we're talking about uh, people who had been spreading around in, in Europe from, say, uh, from the second millennium all the way up to the first century BC. And these people are described as nomadic people. And they are going to spread through much of Europe. These people, known as the Celts, and we'll talk more about the name very uh, later on, these people that we now call the Celts, were uh, we classify them as Indo-European. Indo-European because of the languages that they spoke. They spoke Indo-European dialects that would later be classified as Celtic languages. So. Here they are, they have come into, uh, into Europe, they're in Central Europe, uh, they settle in various parts of Europe, we'll talk more about that, we'll reiterate some of this in a moment. So from a heartland in Central Europe, they, the Celts, settled in places like modern day France, which back then they called Gaul. They also moved into Northern Spain, they also would eventually head north up into the British Isles. And by this time, it's around the 8th and 7th centuries BC. So the Celts would be occupying lands that stretched from the British Isles to the north all the way down into Europe to Gaul or France and, of course, to the east as well. I also have some maps that show you what some historians call a, quote, Celtic empire. They had, they, the Celts, had many dealings 
with the other cultures that surrounded them. And of course, we're talking about many other cultures, but specifically we'll be focusing on the uh, Greeks and the Romans, because the Greeks and the Romans are the ones who uh, write a lot about uh, their encounters with these uh, Celtic people. Did the Celtic people have a written language? No. The Celtic people, as far as we know, had no written language of their own. So how do we know about them? Well, most of what we know about these Celtic people comes from the writings that other people have about them. For example, comes from the writings of uh, the Greeks, comes from the writings of uh, Romans, and we're going to be bringing that up and reminding you of that as we move on in our lecture today. So they didn't, they didn't have a written language. I eventually, you're going to have people up in the British Isles, like Irish monks will be recording and copying down these old Irish uh, legends and stories. So even though the Celts did not have a written language of their own, they, uh, shall we say, pass things down through oral tradition, and other people wrote about them. So, we can piece together what we would call a fair picture of, uh, of these people, but not just on what was written down, because we can't believe everything, necessarily, that the, the uh, Greeks, for example, and the Romans said about them, because they're going to be biased. So we can kind of uh, read some of their stuff and get a lot of information, but they're going to look at these people as, quote, barbarians. But we can piece together a lot about the Celts from the writings. We use writings of the Greeks and the Romans, for example, and we also use archaeological records because that's very important, the archaeological records. So it's interesting. These people, the Celts, were the dominant power in Central Europe before the Romans became the dominant power there. So again, we have to piece together their history through scattered uh, references to them by other people and through archaeological evidence. And you know, this is interesting too, that these people that known as the Celts had been occupying Europe, we believe, uh, for more than 25 centuries. And again, I'm going to reiterate, some of this is the same as what you heard, but, but many people don't realize this. A lot of times when people think of Celtic, they automatically just think of, oh, up in the British Isles. Many people don't realize that, that those Celts that ended up in the British Isles started out in Europe, we believe. The Celts occupied land in modern, what's now modern Eastern Europe, in Greece, in Spain, in Northern Italy, in Western Europe, as well as England, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, for example. And then uh, as far as their, uh, their, uh, their, their story, like I said, uh, we have to piece it together. Anthropologists were, were kind of uh, confused and historians were a little bit confused about these people for a, a long time, but uh, it's partly because they were a non-literate culture. But again, even though they were a non-literate culture, their stories were passed down by oral tradition and eventually uh, later written down by some of the uh, Irish monks and, uh, of course, coming into contact with the Greeks and the Romans. So let's talk a little bit about what we know from some of the uh, archaeological evidence and from some of the writings of the classical authors. The, supposedly, the Celts impressed the Romans and the Greeks with, uh, with the, the way that they dressed, what some, some would describe as their bold style of dress and their, quote, powerful appearance. 
um, the classical observers, for, you know, the Greeks and the Romans, would describe these people usually uh, having fair hair, either red or, or blonde, gold, as, as some, some people called it, uh, having fair complexions, and uh, we're going to hear some, uh, some other descriptions in a moment. But so usually, again, they're described people. Fair hair, uh, sometimes red, sometimes gold in color, and fair complexions. And apparently, this is kind of uh, interesting, uh, by what some of the sources say, is that apparently the, the, uh, the uh, Celtic women were uh, taller than the average Roman citizen. At least that's what some sources say. So that, that's kind of interesting. We've, we've heard stor stories of, of some really tall uh, Celtic men and women. Anyway, the Celtic women uh, supposedly um, had a certain way that they, once they uh, reached maturity, a certain way that they would uh, braid their hair. And that's something that is noted by uh, uh, some of the classical authors uh, and, uh, and the kind of uh, clothing that they wore. The, uh, the kind of uh, dresses that they wore that would be uh, embroidered and, and, and very beautiful. Uh, the, the, the Celtic people would sometimes wear what we would describe as plaid uh, 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 cloaks, for example. Uh, men and women would wear these sorts of uh, cloaks that were, were plaid, and a lot of times people think of Plaid. They think of the they think of the uh, the the Scots up in Scotland. Well, yeah, these people are um, some descended from some of these Celts, and and also the uh, both men and women would wear, shall we say, um, um, arm. Uh, let's, let's just say jewelry that would adorn the body, uh, described as gold and silver torques and rills, as well as rings. The, 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 some of these Celts were, were, were quite wealthy, and, and they liked their jewelry. They liked their bling, if you will. So that, that's another thing that's interesting. Also, uh, the, uh, they used what we call brooches, or some people say brooches, but brooches that would pin and hold together, excuse me, <laughs> pin and hold, uh, uh, close the openings of their, their dresses or, uh, or, or uh, uh, other uh, wear, or they might uh, decorate their clothing with these brooches. And this stuff has been found, uh, uh, like I said, among uh, archaeological artifacts of these people. And, and this is a, another thing that one of the classical sources said, that the, uh, the, the, the Celts in, 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 in Gaul, they call them the, the Gaelic or Gallic Celts, commonly spiked their hair and bleached it to an almost white color with some kind of chalky water. So that's kind of interesting. And they wore their beards long. They wore their beards long. And some of them, far to the north, would eventually be tattooing their, their faces and their arms with blue. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, again, uh, about the archaeological evidence, uh, many of the Danish and the English bogs, you may have heard of that, have um, yielded archaeological evidence of these people. For example, they might find a, a, a well, pretty well-preserved mummy and, and uh, a mummy that, uh, that may have, uh, you know, have clothing uh, and, and they can, they can well, I've actually seen some of this stuff on, 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 on television where they've, they've found some of the stuff. They could, they could uh, uh, tell you about the kind of clothes that they wore. So, so that's kind of fascinating how, how stuff gets preserved by accident uh, out, in, out in the bogs. Anyway, so uh, we also have uh, Roman historians. Uh, for example, Tacitus, Roman historian Tacitus talks about these people. Uh, talks a little bit about the customs of these people and their everyday life. So, so we, we, we get uh, different information from, about these people from different ways, even though they didn't have a written language of their, their own. Uh, another thing I'd like to mention about the, the Celts is, is their, the, the quality, <laughs> the quality of their metalwork. These people were very, very 
technically and artistically advanced. And, and they're, quote, uh, almost uh, forgotten by, by, by the, well, they are, by the, by the average person who doesn't know much about history. But these people were very technologically, well, we'll say, uh, for that day and time, and artistically advanced. Most of these Celtic people lived in, in, in farming villages, farming villages that can be described as uh, very well populated. Very well populated farming villages. They might have larger towns, uh, larger towns that would be linked with other settlements uh, that would act as, as meeting places for their economic and cultural activity. So th these people were, shall we say, uh, a lot more, quote, civilized than others uh, may give them credit for. They had fortified cities, they had shrines, they, uh, they had well-traveled roadways. I mean, we could go on and on and on about the, uh, the Celtic people. The evidence uh, that we've been able to find tells us a story that these people had a very complex society. And we're talking about a very complex society in, quote, pre-Roman Europe, a very complex society. So modern scholars are starting to rethink some of the things that the Romans and the Greeks said about them. For example, you have several different writers. Even Caesar wrote stuff about because he came in contact with these, uh, some of these Celts uh, in, in what we call Gaul. And so, so we have to, to kind of, shall we say, be careful about what some of the Romans have said about them because they called them barbarians. The Romans viewed them as barbarians. Isn't that interesting? But now we are looking upon these people as, shall we say, as advanced cultures that had a, a network of uh, uh, common linguistic heritage and a network of trade. And we could just go on and on about these people. However, it's not been, it's, it's not been easy for uh, shall we say, historians and, and archaeologists to, quote, piece together things about these people. It's not an easy thing to do, and we know that we are missing much, much information. We're not even sure where the term Celtic even came from. I can give you a few uh, perhaps uh, ideas, but no one is sure where the term Celtic comes from. So we have a, a great deal of uh, what we call inconsistency in the classical sources. Uh, we have uh, incomplete information. Uh, for example, the Greeks, this is what they called them. You don't have to write this part down. It's just very similar to Celt. Keltoi and Galatitae by the Greeks. The Romans called them Keltai or Galai. 2,000 years ago, the term Celt was used specifically for the people inhabiting the continent of Europe. The term, the term Celtic back then was used, uh, again, by the, by the Romans, for example, and it was used specifically for the people on the continent of Europe, not up in the British Isles. That's something that they're going to do later. And, uh, Listen, listen to this. It's not going to be until the 17th, 17th, and 18th century that linguistic scholars are going to start identifying the people that live in pre-Roman Britain with the Celtic people. They'll start linking them and say, oh, these people are Celtic. And now when people hear the term Celtic, they just simply think of people in the British Isles. But that wasn't the case 2,000 years ago. Now, now we're going to talk about some of the encounters with these people. Some of the encounters with these uh, Celtic people. The first historical 
recorded encounter of a group of people that, uh, that displayed any kind of traits, we could say, associated with the Celts, comes from the time period of around 400 BC. And these people were coming from Northern Italy. And this is, these are people that the Etruscans would even call barbarian, that the Romans would call barbarian. And they came down from Northern Italy, they came down from the Alps, and eventually they're going to be, shall we say, displacing or kicking out the Etruscans from the fertile area of the Po River in Northern Italy. So they're going to be coming down, they're going to be, quote, displacing the, uh, the Etruscans uh, from the uh, fertile Po River Valley. And it's the Celts that are going to have a lot to do with the Etruscan downfall. That's the, that's the phrase I want to use. It's, it's, the, it's these people that will definitely help to push the Etruscans out of history's limelight, as we could say. They, the Celts, are going to have a lot to do with uh, the downfall of the Etruscan civilization. The next encounter with the Celts came when the Roman Empire was very, very young, and uh, that would be directly south of the Po River. Anyway, so let's talk now about the decline of the Etruscan civilization. What caused the Etruscan civilization to fall? Well, I've already told you that the Celts had something to do with it, definitely. But the main cause, the main cause was an out-and-out -out invasion of the Celts. They didn't, quote, just have something to do with it. They had a lot to do with it. These Celtic tribes were able to push down into Italy and invade Etruscan territory. They pushed down uh, further, further south of the Po River, and they actually pushed down into the area that was known as Etruria. And they are doing this by, you know, the, um, in the fourth and fifth century BC. The Celts are gonna wreak such havoc that they're going to be coming all the way down to Rome in the fourth century and virtually destroying the city. I mean, these people were tough. So Rome is going, this is before Rome becomes powerful and great. Right now, during this time, um, Rome is still in her, quote, infancy. She was becoming powerful, but, but boy, they're, they're actually going to come in and, uh, and uh, sack Rome, as they call it. So again, the Celtic Empire, that's what some historians call it. It's kind of a, it wasn't really a, I like to say it wasn't, quote, a real empire, but that's what some people call it. Uh, you have, a, quote, a, a loose confederation of, of uh, cities and tribes and that sort of thing. But it was around, right around the year 400, again, we're mentioning that year, uh, where, the, where the Celts were at their peak of power, we like to say. Around 400 BC, they, are, they were at their, their height of power. And they actually uh, had a, a king that was fairly, fairly powerful at that time, a warrior king. And we hear about this from, from for example, a Greek historian, excuse me, not a Greek historian. We hear about this from a Roman historian called Livy. He talks about this king, he names this king, and uh, we believe that, that this king was the head of, of one of the most powerful tribes in, in this uh, Celtic confederation. And boy, they, uh, they were, were able to have a, a considerable uh, bit of, shall we say, military power. Uh, at this time, they had a, a considerable bit of, or uh, we could say, degree of political unity, and, and, and they, were, 
they were quite a force to be reckoned with by the 400, uh, uh, shall we say, the, by around 400 BC. These Celts were really, really rough. And why did they want to invade Italy? Well, who wouldn't? I, <laughs> I like to say it like that. Who wouldn't want to invade Italy back then? I mean, the, the area was beautiful, and, and many, oh, if you've ever been to this area of Tuscany, Italy, it is, it is very beautiful. Anyway, so, so they're attracted, they, meaning the, uh, the Celts, are attracted by, by the rich land there, and particularly in, in northern Italy. So they come, they come pouring down through the Alps, and, 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 and they're fighting with the uh, Etruscans, as we said before. They are, they are, uh, the, the Etruscans are, are trying to defend themselves. And then, and then we, we have the, the, uh, the, the Etruscans are trying to fight off the, the Celts, and the Romans are coming up and, and pushing uh, 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 on the, the Etruscans uh, the other way, from the south. So the Etruscans are, are shall we say, dealing with a lot uh, during this time. So the Celts are going to have a lot to do with uh, the demise of the Etruscan civilization. And the Romans helped as well. <laughs> Eventually, the Romans will be throwing off the, the Etruscans, and I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in, in just a moment. From the mid, from the mid fourth century BC, we have the, we had this once flourishing civilization known as the Etruscans, and they're going to be reduced. They're going to be reduced to city-states, and they will retreat to their original territories in central Italy. And then as the power of Rome grows, Rome will come to dominate the Etruscans who had once dominated them. So it was the Etruscans who had, the, quote, the power, the most power, we believe, in Italy before the Romans began, began their rise up. So the city of Rome was dominated by Etruscan kings. They were, they were dominated by the Etruscans. And eventually, that's going to change. So in the end, they all participated in the final struggle of the newly born Roman Empire by the third century B.C. In the end, they all participated. They who, well, I'm talking about the, uh, the Celts, I'm talking about the Etruscans, and uh, the once proud Etruscans who had their city-states, who had their, their, uh, their uh, shall we say, uh, they had uh, what we would call a confederation of, of cities. Eventually, they are not going to be able to hold up against the Romans. They're not going to be able to uh, coordinate any real resistance to the Romans. And one by one, the Etruscan cities are going to be defeated, one by one. 509 B.C., that's the year that the Romans actually drove the last Etruscan king out of their city. And they began to control their own city once again. And you say, what city? The city of Rome itself. So it was 509 BC when the Romans drove the last Etruscan king from power. And it wasn't long after that. Soon thereafter, the Romans will establish a republic. So you'll be learning about the Roman Republic very soon in the upcoming lectures. But at first, the Romans had a republic. And uh, we're going to see that their power is going to grow. But for the time being, I just want to say a few more words about the Etruscans. With the loss of their political independence, the cycle of these ancient people who had dominated the cultural and the economic, uh, 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 shall we say, uh, systems 
of Italy and the Western Mediterranean, their power is going to come to an end. And the Romans are going to be learning a lot from the Etruscans. We've, al we've already mentioned uh, that the, the Romans are going to get some of their political ideas from the Etruscans. The Romans, oh, we haven't mentioned this yet, but uh, the, besides uh, the uh, religion, the language that supposedly came by way of the Greeks, uh, they're, uh, they're also going to be getting, and we didn't mention this, some of their dress. The, the Romans are, are going to get some of their style of dress from the Etruscans. For example, the, um, the short cloak and uh, some other styles of dress. Also, and this is something that will, will uh, perpetuate, I like to say, in, in a way, through the centuries, is the Romans are going to get from the Etruscans their symbol for power. And their symbol for power is something that we call the fasces. This is, uh, has been described as an axe surrounded by a bundle of rods. And it was the insignia, the fasces was the insignia for, I guess we could say the Etruscan kings, quote, a symbol of power. And so the Romans are going to use the fasces, and it's going to represent definitely their power, and they are going to become very powerful. Now, it's going to be slowly, slowly the Romans are going to, be, they, they throw off the Etruscan kings from their city. Then they start, uh, uh, shall we say, they're defending themselves from others. They, they start spreading. They start conquering nearby territories to, quote, make themselves feel more secure. And the, the, uh, the Roman culture becomes very, shall we say, very militarily oriented. And as you're going to be finding out in your, your next units, the Romans are going to be slowly, yet surely, conquering Italy, and they will conquer the, Itali the entire Italian peninsula. The Romans are going to be going up against people known as the, uh, uh, what, what we call the Carthaginians, who uh, this uh, city of Carthage had started out as, as a Phoenician settlement, and, and the Romans are going to be going to war with them. And uh, you're going to be finding out a lot about how the Rome it's like the more power she gets, the more power she wants. And Rome is going to be, shall we say, uh, going to war with people that she feels, quote, threatened by. And, and then she's going to find out the more she goes to war, uh, the more victory she has, and the more money and slaves that come into Italy and Rome uh, will, will get more and more powerful and then finally spread all the way around the Mediterranean. So just to wind it up, I just want to emphasize again that the Celts had a lot to do with Roman history. Uh, you, you, uh, you will hear about uh, many writers that talk about their encounters with the Celts, but the Romans are going to be dealing with constant warfare with the, these people on and off. Uh, for example, when you hear about Julius Caesar, uh, he, he will be fighting what they call uh, Gallic Wars, and he will actually even write about, uh, write about uh, these wars. And uh, so they definitely played a big role in, in history. And, of course, the Etruscans definitely had a, a, an impact on the Roman civilization. And we mentioned many of the, the things that were passed on to the Romans by the Etruscans. But one of the things that the Romans are not going to do that the Etruscans did, and that was the way uh, uh, they treated their women, for example. So the Celts and the Etruscans played big roles in Roman society.
Okay, so when we come back, we will learn, keep learning about the Romans, and we'll learn about the Roman monarchy. Um, at least for a brief period of time, the Romans actually had a king, although they will come to despise that word as we'll see through the progression of Roman history. Until next time.